Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe, the podcast series for beginner web developers and general web enthusiasts. Now, introducing your show hosts, Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Keynes, and Ed Mann. Hello and welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. My name's Ed Mann. Today we are very lucky to be joined by Ahmed Nasri. Uh, Ahmed is the head of engineering at Mashup. Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I mean, for the audience, so I've been working a lot with Kong recently, actually, in my day job. And I was, you know, again, it's very much kind of looking around and I was emailing around and Ahmed was very kind enough to say he'll come on the show. But I mean, before we start on, on Kong and all that, it's, it's always nice to kind of get a backstory of the of the actual guest. And I know that because you recently did a really good podcast on the, the changelog for our audience, maybe summarizing it. I'll definitely point them in the direction of the changelog one, but kind of given a kind of a recap of what kind of how you got to where you got uh, where you are now. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we talked about like how I actually was born and raised in Syria before I came to Canada and uh, pretty much spent my entire youth in Syria. Uh, I think I came to Canada around when I was 19 or 20. Um, but prior to that in Syria growing up, uh, obviously, you know, being a third world country and uh, uh, kind of under the axis of terror and all the world boycotts and all that fun stuff, we really didn't have access to much in terms of technology, um, especially when I was growing up, the internet was really um so far behind the rest of the world so uh in, in in our neighboring country in lebanon we actually they actually had internet access for years uh but in syria we didn't know it was forbidden so for me just to get access online and being able to go and discover the rest of the world we actually had to, di- to dial up long distance to the neighboring country to lebanon <laughs> just to get access to the internet and i still remember like the very first days of the internet for me at least was like when i first logged in and see yahoo and alta vista and, and google and all these things and really yahoo was the big thing back then the whole idea of a portal website where you just come in and spend the whole day online there um of course my dad didn't like the uh the bills that, 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 that <laughs> raking there. up the money there yeah yeah it, it just it was just too much and too expensive but at the same time because it was illegal um they yeah, we I couldn't do it from the house from home so um, I'll basically go down to my dad's office and do it there because at least it's under the guise of you know it's a business so long distance calls might occur um, but even then the the kind of the like the secret intelligence service uh, for the for the country uh, who are basically just bad people um, they would go around and try to hunt people down or um, trying to dial the internet god forbid um because it's just they just wanted to have a full control over the methods of communications um in the country so uh, lots of adventures there around uh you know evading the police and evading uh being captured by them because it's just i can imagine yeah a lot of uh, fun things you learned there kind of encryption wise and things like that to kind of get around it all Oh, yeah. And like hacking the modems and like, you know, encrypting the connection and doing all sort of weird things back then, uh, picky bagging on a number of connections just so you can lose this, the tracing signals. Um, a lot of interesting stuff back then. But, um, the other story that I didn't tell on the change log that might be interesting to you to hear. Um, you know, so like I did the internet thing, I did the software thing, but at the same time, I was a lot, like too much into electronics and hardware. And one of the things that also happened to be legal in Syria was satellite dishes. Um, so we had a lot of people who obviously worked at like the U.S. consulates and the, the British embassies and so on, like foreigners who lived in the country. And they, you know, they clearly didn't want to see Syrian TV because <laughs> it was very limited in, in the kind of choices that they have. So obviously they want to get more, you know, global broadcast. And uh, a lot of people were doing illegal installations of satellite dishes. And there was a loophole in the kind of in the government laws that, you know, they are illegal, so you can't inst- you can't be caught installing them. But once they're installed, they're technically part of the structure of the building, so they just won't tear them down. So it became this like uh, uh, cat and mouse chase thing, where yeah, so trying you know, to find people actually putting them up, and then realizing yeah. they put it up, and it's oh, now I can't get them. <laughs> exactly, and then and then you know, obviously, I that was appealing to me because you know, not only is it challenging the system but also you know it's technology and like interesting so like hacking uh, the hard physical hardware of the uh, of the satellite uh, uh, dish networks just to get access to the encrypted channels too because uh, a lot of them were free obviously over the air but they were also encrypted channels and encrypted kind of dish network channels as we have today and all that stuff um, so we were actually hacking the physical hardware just to get beyond the encryption and get access to those uh, network. So I remember the days when, uh, you know, we'd be installing the, the satellite dishes, me and my cousin, 
on the rooftops of buildings. And of course the police show up and then we have to do the literal kind of rooftop chase um, <laughs> and, and jump from one building to the other. So that's why every time I see a, a Hollywood movie with rooftop chases, I'm like, that's, that's not really how it works. I've seen it. I've been there. You, you've been that. there. You've done it. Yeah. You've got the t-shirt yeah. and all that. Yeah, oh, it's wow. not realistic. Yeah. So when you were younger then, was it pr- primarily hardware that you were interested in or, or was it the software as well? Well, well, it's kind of like touched on both worlds. So like, you know, obviously with the satellite stuff, I was hacking the hardware and touching on the software as well. Um, because it's the encryption was all made in the software yeah. level, of course, on the, on the receivers. Um, but same thing with the PlayStation. Like, you know, we did the whole, um, game shark system back in the day and like that involved hacking the, the hardware, the physical hardware of the PlayStation, but then installing the, 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 the different operating system on top of it just to get that cheating system ongoing. Um, so, you know, it, it, it started out with the electronics, obviously being, I think, where a lot of people start with technology in general. Um, it's this idea of transistors and electro- electrical systems and setting up your own little labs at at, the, at at home or in school even. And then slowly that kind of pushed me towards software. And, you know, from there I transitioned to, to just doing software. And especially later in, the, uh, in my youth where, like, internet actually came into the country as an official government provided internet obviously half the, half the websites were blocked uh, but that's where like there was a real boom and people getting online and creating websites uh, and like pushing some business online and that's where I found myself actually doing a lot of that stuff actually creating websites and creating applications and creating systems that are connected uh, for people online so did you have a lot of a lot of your learning a teach and like teaching sorry your learning was really through the internet then or were, were you teaching and helping other people and they were helping you like friends and things like that Primar- yeah primarily through the internet and I had a bit of an advantage because I I spoke uh, like I actually made a lot of friends uh, in the UK and uh, American uh, kind of embassies and people around that ecosystem uh, there was a lot of Engl- uh, like uh, schools and programs that brought in foreigners into the country. So a lot of them were English speaking people and I made friends with that, with those kids, obviously playing Counter-Strike together. Um, that's, that's the connection. Um, but it just helped me with my English a lot. So that also helped me getting online and learning a lot about things that are online. Because while a lot of people are interested in technology, interested in, you know, educating themselves as well online, um, many of the resources out there were still, were, were still in English. There was not as much kind of Arabic, uh, resources to use. And still today it's, pretty limited in comparison. Um, so you go to any programming websites uh, documentation, you go to any language documentation, primarily it's in English. You'll be very, it's very rare to see something uh, fully documented in Arabic. So I had a bit of an advantage in that regard, uh, just because of my English language skills. And I ended up helping people out and teaching them as well, um, even through university where I ended up going to computer science, but eventually dropped off because I already knew a lot of these things going in. Um, I ended up do- doing tutoring on the side to students who were studying programming and English as well, because I just were ahead of, of people in that. So I just ended up helping out others. That's cool. And also that brings it, that kind of highlights again, your entrepreneurial side, you know, where, you know, you really from a young age, even like some in, on the chase, like you're saying, like you're selling cheat codes and things like that. You've really been in, you enjoy the idea of getting a technology and then kind of taking advantage of it and being able to like monetize it and well, not monetize it, but, you know, kind of get the best out of it. Well, I always saw the like I always saw opportunities and things that people either took for granted or um, were too kind of intimidated by them. So, like on the change lock, I spoke about how I I did the uh, when I was a kid, like this was nine years old, maybe or seven years old. I I, I used to grab these magazines that are written in English that I also like because I, my English was good. I, I I was able to read these gaming magazines, primarily PlayStation magazine, because that was my favorite. And on the back of it, they would print some cheats and some like uh, cheat codes for games. And I would take those cheat codes and sell them to my, you know, fellow students and peers in school um, for a little bit of money. But it was still that kind of it was new. Nobody really thought about cheats and like getting uh, game codes and, you know, how to bypass a level by getting a cheat code or whatever. So like and, and, and they could still get the magazine, but they were, really wouldn't comprehend to the level of detail that I could in terms of reading a yeah. tutorial or a walkthrough, right? Because they used to publish these walkthroughs in magazines, like, you know, the full walkthrough of Tomb Raider 2. Um, like, they might be able to grasp a hint from the pictures, but not to the level of detail to actually understanding the full walkthrough. And that's where I came in and kind of monetized on that. Um, same thing with the uh, with the tutoring in, in computer science. I was actually charging for that. So um, to the point where the university kind of wanted to shut me down because what I ended up doing... <laughs> I, I went out uh, and 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 rented a a internet cafe, 
uh, that was very close to the university and converted it after hours because of course in the like in op- normal business operation they still operate as an internet cafe but then after hour i converted it to a computer lab and then you know students would leave university after like after they're done and you know go home grab dinner and then come back to my computer lab and then we'd still do the whole course all over again that they didn't quite get in school or in university um, i would do it again and explain it all to them and they would get it to the point where I, I think I almost got my entire class of computer science students coming to my my course, and that they is awesome. eventually stopped going to the programming course. <laughs> they, no, they pick it out from Ahmed afterwards. <laughs> yeah, so they obviously the university didn't like that. But um, did you ever think of going into like the teaching kind of field and things like that? I did, and you know what? When I first came to Toronto and first came to Canada, um, obviously being brand new to the country, and I didn't know a lot about people and the culture, and like just trying to, like you know, uh, you know assimilate into the, the, the Canadian lifestyle. Um, one of the things I ended up doing is volunteering a lot of my time for like, um, all these, uh, you know, uh, code programs and teaching people how to code programs. Uh, so there's a, f- a lot of them in Toronto and I just like, I still do like to like right now I'm doing note school Toronto, uh, as part of the group here that helps people learn about note, not jazz. Um, but you know, I've done ladies learning code. I've done kids learning code. I've done uh, mentoring at like uh, Bitmaker Labs and a few other kind of uh, coding schools in Toronto. That you know, I just end up giving some of my time away, whether it's weekends or evenings, and just help people kind of learn code and understand the kind of fundamentals behind it. And that's kind of been carried with me through those days of doing doing the tutoring back in the university. And, and and from there, so your programming stack. So what a university, what were you kind of, what languages were you using and things like that? Was it a typical computer science, C, Java and things like that? Yeah, just C. And I never did Java in, in university, but it was just C at the time. And I did some Perl. Um, and then obviously, as I got into the web stuff, I did a lot of PHP things. Um, yeah, because I noticed through your GitHub repository that, you know, you've got some Zen stuff there. So uh, how long have you been, how long so how long did, were you using PHP for primarily? Because I'm assuming you've probably moved on now to JavaScript, like Node, as you say, Node school and things like that. Yeah, so, you know, as I as I transitioned from, as I came to Canada, obviously, and started doing a lot of freelancing work here, um, uh, PHP was obviously a good language for that. A lot of, uh, you know, at the time, there was this trend of everybody wanting to build social media sites. Yes. <laughs> uh, everybody wanted, this is like 2005. Uh, everybody wanted to have their own Friendster. Everybody wanted to have their own, um, you know, Facebook clone and dating websites. So like there was a lot of business there in terms of being a freelance PHP developer, especially because there's a lot of these PHP scripts and CMSs out there that facilitated that. And they were especially built for that kind of uh, community building websites. I remember Ning and a few others too. Um, so there was a lot of work for me there as a freelancer. And that was great because I tried to come back into university uh, in Toronto. But of course, they didn't recognize my credits or my kind of um, uh, previous education. So I'm like, okay, fine. Drop out. No need to continue there. I've already got work. I've already mm, got business going absolutely. from home. Um, and then, of course, I actually got a job in Toronto. That was my very first actual job in PHP doing programming. So that was great. Uh, so I have a lot of, you know, as much as people like to diss on PHP, I have a very, <laughs> very special place for it in my heart. Um, I know it has its problems. It's not a perfect language, but uh, it it helped me come a long way. Um, and yeah, and then, and then you mentioned Zen, like at the time, uh, uh, as soon as Zen came out with their uh, Zen Framework 1, um, you know, that jumped right on, onto that. And I started writing like libraries and little uh, kind of uh, snippets and frameworks around it. Uh, especially, and that's how I actually got to connect with Mache because back in those days, APIs and RESTful design wasn't really as dominant. Uh, the principles were still there as part of the HTTP spec, but it wasn't really something people were paying too much attention to, especially with the, with SOAP and, um, you know, the Oasis standards. Um, so for me, you know, that, like the HTTP spec made more sense and the rest kind of uh, worlds coming to being made more sense. So I started writing some libraries in PHP for, you know, making RESTful um, APIs with Zend. And that actually picked up a lot of steam. That was like, I started writing a blog and that's when I actually had my very few blog entries and the article that I described how to make Zend work as a RESTful framework. I think it's got thousands of hits and that was like my first time ever, um, you know, being featured and linked to from different websites like Slashdot and so on. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but then that was kind of my foray into APIs. And ever since then, I've been just building tools and libraries as open source projects 
um, specifically around APIs and around, you know, application design in general, uh, and just seeing the kind of reaction of people using them and, you know, implementing them. And I remember specifically that Zen PHP library that I made back then, um, you know, getting into open source, we just, you know, I just put it up on GitHub and actually it wasn't even on GitHub, it was on Google code. Google code. Like yeah. Back in the day yeah. now. Feels ages That's ago. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I remember like one time somebody emails me and people always emailing me about it, asking questions or, uh, providing feedback and, you know, changes and pull requests. But some one, one time, one person emailed me. He's like, you know, I really like your code. It works for me, but I can't use it because it doesn't have a license file. Um, I really, really, really need you to put a license file in there. Otherwise I'm not allowed to use it in my company. And I'm like, dude, it's okay. It's free. Just go for it. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. There's legal issues. Oh, yeah. If you, if you don't actually have a license file declaring that your code is open source and free. And then I look at his email address and it says like CERN. And I'm like, that, that sounds like CERN, the, the hydron collider. And it turns out that, yeah, like this guy was working as part of the CERN initiative and they were building some tools and APIs internally. And obviously because it's a scientific endeavor, they just don't want to take proprietary code in and then being sued for it. And then guess what? You know, the Higgs boson is now my, my legal <laughs> claim. Um, so therefore I put in a license file in there, but that was kind of the cool experience of seeing how you know, you build an open source project, even if it's a small library, even if it's like the, the most minuscule of things. And in my case, it was just a little bit of modification to Zen framework to make it, you know, API, uh, RESTful API friendly. And, you know, people can be using it in all different aspects and all different parts of the world. And, you know, it just makes their life easier and ends up being part of bigger things. Um, and, things that you, you know, would never think it could have been. That's the beautiful thing, isn't it? Like you say with the CERN thing, you would never think. Exactly. This would, yeah. Like for all I know, that could have been, you know, taking a minuscule, tiny part in some scientific discovery. And, you know, that's amazing. That's great. It is very cool. And so with Michelle, you say, you know, that you kind of were speaking with them about the PHP. So it's the restful stuff there. And is that how you got into the company then? Was that your kind of foray into it? Or did were you doing more PHP stuff before entering the no, company? No, at that, at that point, I had transitioned into different programming languages, of course. And uh, back in 2013 is when I first connected with Mashape. Um, and I had built a, um, uh, this was uh, just as soon as the uh, Chrome re Web App Store came out, I built a uh, RESTful application uh, for the Chrome Web Store. It's called REST Console. And uh, the Mashape team kind of discovered that as well. They're like, oh, cool. Like, this is a great RESTful application um, for testing and debugging APIs. You know, and I would like to sponsor it. And I'm like, Wait, who's this Mash Shape? <laughs> Mash Shap? Mash Shapey? I don't know. What is this company? Because uh, I never heard of them at the time. And uh, at the time I was at, in Canada at the CBC, uh, leading the development team uh, at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation here, uh, which is like the BBC, but in Canada, yep. um, for those who don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I, I ended up chatting with the team and getting to know a little bit more about Mash Shape and the company and understanding, you know, the, this cool kind of ecosystem of, uh, of APIs and tooling that they created around APIs. And at the time, Mashape was, uh, you know, primarily focused on the API marketplace, which is, you know, kind of like the eBay of APIs. You come in and you can publish your APIs, sell them, or just give them out for free. And as a developer, you can come and discover APIs and also use them, uh, for your applications. Um, so you kind of have this kind of, uh, one API key, multiple, um, APIs experience, which made life a lot easier for developers. Uh, and then internally, as part of the as part of the marketplace work, we ended up building all these tools and products that ended up, uh, you know, becoming standalone products on their own. Primarily Kong, as you know, being the uh, API management gateway and proxy, and then Galileo for the analytics platform, uh, and then all the open source work and projects that we build around the, the marketplace too, like Unirest, for example, is a very popular. HTTP client library that just simplifies the way people can do HTTP calls over multiple languages. So there's Unirest in PHP, which now I maintain, um, even though that's the only thing I do in PHP anymore. Um, there's uh, Unirest uh, Node.js, there's Unirest Java, there's Unirest, uh, I think, uh, Objective-C and so on. So it's just kind of a unified way across all languages for you to make HTTP calls, which is nice because if you're developing a mobile application, uh, and building a server-side components for it, it's kind of nice to have the same kind of syntax, the same method names. It just makes life a little bit easier. I mean, what what stack do you actually use then there? Because I, as I was saying, looking through that, and I looked at Unirest, and I just thought, what what actual languages do you use? Are you very much a polyglot kind of approach? That's right. And uh, depending on the platform and depending on what makes more sense for the platform that we built for. Uh, so, for example, Kong is obviously written entirely in Lua, 
because of OpenRSC and Nginx, the relationship there already exists. So that's where Lua came in as obviously the obvious choice and really the only choice. Um, and in terms of Galileo, for example, it's uh, it's very heavy on Node.js stuff, but also has a little bit of uh, Java in there. In terms of uh, Gelato, uh, it's entirely written in Ruby and Ember on the front end. In terms of the marketplace, it's a whole mix of things. Uh, like, it's a it's a it's on mini universe of microservices, really. So the marketplace actually has a lot of Java, a lot of Node.js, uh, even has some Python in there, and uh, kind of a mix of things that just make different sense for different purposes. So we don't just use a language or a stack and say that's that's how we're going to build everything with. We look at the environment and the kind of solutions that we're trying to create and figure out what makes more sense for them. And and, and obviously that then brings into Kong. And, um, you know, that's kind of, for me, that's where I know you from. And, you know, I, I really like it a lot. And we've been using it probably a couple of months now. And I'm just wondering, uh, how did Kong come into being then? Because I know you speak about the marketplace. Was it through there that it was kind of brought out? So yeah, there was a couple of kind of unique scenarios that we found ourselves in within the marketplace. Uh, obviously being, you know, the single entry point for all APIs has its own set of challenges. But even beyond that, we have, you know, users of the R marketplace that are, let's say, in Europe, like yourself, or, you know, in, in the UK and in, in, in the US or in South America or anywhere in the world. And they have their APIs published in different regions as part of where they are located. So, for example, you might have the Guardian who's in the UK. Uh, they have API, uh, the API servers are both on Europe zones and US zones uh, for, you know, serving their audience on uh, both locations. Um, and then furthermore, their consumers might be all over the world too. So you have this uh, kind of a representation of the internet obviously being distributed. And by building APIs that you want to make as distributed and as fast as possible, you have this big requirement of being um, as close to the consumer as possible, but also as close to the provider as possible. So that's kind of the one, one of the constraints that we had to figure out in the marketplace. And then we ended up solving that with Kong. Um, the other constraint was that you, you know, you have all these different standards and ways and methods of people building APIs, whether it's REST, whether it's SOAP, whether it's, you know, using, um, HAL or JSON kind of API format or any of the other kind of distinctions and specs that are out there. You, we really have to support every which way an API provider wants to build an API, crazy or not, smart or not, simple <laughs> or complex. We have it to just has to work, right? absolutely. Exactly. And same thing for API consumers. They also have their own expectations and their own set of standards that they want to use, uh, regardless of, or, of what the API provider is providing. So, you know, we had to be everything for everybody, and that's a very challenging thing to do. And the only way you can really do that is by letting go of your own personal opinions as technologists and developers and just be unopinionated in your tools and your products. So, you know, Kong is obviously not the only product out there that does API management. There's a few others, but the main distinction between Kong and all the others is that Kong is entirely unopinionated about how you want to build your API or how you want to consume APIs through it. You can really design the system however which way you want. And we went into that primarily because of our marketplace needs, because we built Kong for our own needs, for our own usage in the marketplace. And of course, in the marketplace, we had hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of developers and tens of thousands of APIs. Um, and the kind of bandwidth that we were processing is insane, uh, both in, in quantity as well as uh, kind of traffic size. So, um, you know, just to give you some, some interesting numbers, like the entirety of the marketplace, which includes, um, uh, you know, APIs like Spotify and Imager and a lot of others, um, that have, you know, millions of calls per day, if not per hour, are all running on four medium sized AWS servers running Kong. And that's really, I mean, not to claim that, uh, fully to, to our benefit, but that's really a lot of it is Nginx and Kong is built on top of Nginx. It's picking a good choice. I think that that's, you know, as well, isn't it? And you say like, as your company, you know, you, you pick the right tool for the job and like the right that's language. Right. And I'm just wondering, like, with the marketplace then, did, did you always set out to have, like, the concept of Kong, how, did it kind of grow through time? Um, or was it, oh, no, we want to make, build something like Kong, we want it to be on Nginx, we want to use Lua, or was it built up through time, you, you know, using other languages like Java, etc.? We've always known we wanted to come down this road as a company, uh, even before I joined the company. Um, the, the, the goal of MassShape is to provide API tooling uh, for uh, for all developers around the world, whether you're a consumer or a provider of APIs. 
And, you know, the marketplace does our foray into making sure that we fully understand the space and solidify the tools that we build around it. Uh, and that goes also for Galileo, our analytics product, not just Kong. Um, so with Kong, we really understood the architecture of APIs and how people expect to build and distribute APIs on a massive scale, uh, as well as consume them. So, you know, we understood that part of the equation, but also as part of the marketplace, we have to provide metrics and information about how people are consuming your APIs, especially for people who are paying or selling their APIs. They want to see numbers. They want to understand the usage behind their APIs and how they can improve their product. And that's where the analytics system that we build in the marketplace ended up evolving into Galileo as well. Uh, so really the division from the start was to have these kind of standalone products uh, that are very unopinionated, that are very flexible, that allow developers to just use them out of the box with minimal configuration. Um, but obviously the architecture of those tools evolved by building the marketplace so we can better understand, uh, you know, by actual usage and actual practice, as opposed to theory, how people would uh, leverage these products. So, so what was it a fact, a matter like of using other languages, building up and then rewriting for Kong? Because I'm right in thinking it had, it was a rewrite from scratch to be open sourced. Uh, it wasn't a rewrite as much as we had to like just take a few things off that were proprietary. Obviously, that wouldn't fit the open source model. Um, so, you know, uh, obviously in the marketplace, for example, we do a lot of uh, transaction processing for paid APIs. So, you know, we kind of had to, you know, obviously remove our keys that were built into the, the code base for those kind of things and uh, remove that system entirely until it's ready. It's being, it's, it can be made into a multi-tenanted system that other people can use. Um, because right now it was specific to our use case in the, in the marketplace. So it's like, that's billing. Um, same thing for other stuff. Like, for example, logging, um, you know, uh, Kong right now, you know, is all plugin oriented and those plugins is what we used internally, but you know, we only had a couple of logging methods that fit our need for the marketplace. So we had to, you know, remove the hard coded path to where we wanted to write the logs and make that variable as an example, and obviously make that configurable for people. So those are the kind of things that we did out of the code base to make it, uh, you know, uh, a proper open source project that's not just uh, uh, specific to the marketplace use case, but it has been built through the marketplace and through the experiences of the marketplace. Uh, as the API management gateway that we needed. And we felt that everybody else can benefit from it too. And that's also the other thing that we're giving it away for free. Um, because we feel that, you know, API management as a tool or as a product is, is a necessity. It's, it's a commodity. People shouldn't be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, you know, five year contracts for these kind of tools. Um, as opposed to, you know, let's just this on the competitors a bit, as opposed to some of the competitors do. Um, they really want to, you know, tie you in for the next five, 10 years. They want to sell you products that are hundreds of thousands of dollars in yearly licenses, uh, if not more. And uh, in many cases, in fact, as far as I know, as far as I reviewed, uh, in many cases, all these products are highly opinionated, meaning that not only do you have to pay an arm and a leg to get these products to work for you, but you also have to change your architecture, change the way you build the APIs uh, just to get the privilege of using these products. So we felt that that is a fundamentally excuse me, fundamentally flawed um, way of actually making these tools and um, products for developers. And that's why we ended up doing Kong as an open source project that is entirely free. There are no strings attached. You can use Kong today for free. You can set up your own architecture on it and you can use it any which way you want in terms of how you design your APIs, how you create your authentication methods and how you route your logic through it. That's interesting you mentioned with the APIs. I'm just wondering, like, you know, because you say it's a, there's no real, you don't specify how you should create an API because everyone has their own implementation. They may have, you know, legacy. They may have their own ideas, what they want to do now. And it may change, you know, eventually over time. This is the best way of being almost is that you can go with the times and stick as HTTP as the base layer of trans, you know, transportation. And that's it. I was wondering with uh, in my shape, like, is there a specific way you build APIs there or is it the similar way where people or different, you know, groups will do different things and then use Kong almost the same way as, you know, you kind of let other people use it? Yeah, I mean, we have a mix of both. Obviously, you know, uh, we have a very tight, tightly coupled engineering team. So we talk a lot, we share ideas a lot and we evolve together in terms of our choices and our, our kind of... Um, uh, usage of tools and standards. So in a lot of cases, our APIs are very similar in the way we design them, but there are obvious, obvious differences too in a lot of the products. So what would work for a analytics system like Galileo obviously wouldn't work for a, a developer portal like Gelato. So while the base principle there is the same, it's all microservices, it's all HTTP base, it's all small components that are re reusable and uh, independent. Um, 
you know, the actual API design might differ. So for example, in the marketplace, we actually use hypermedia a lot as part of our API standard, but for Gelato, we didn't because we're looking at time series data. There's really not too much in, in terms of not much of a story that you want it. to be able to, yeah, bring out of that. Yeah. So, you know, we didn't do that as a choice, right? Um, same thing for Gelato. We're actually more focused on, um, you know, we were actually pushing this feature hopefully this week or next week. Uh, we're adding webhooks into the system for Gelato so people, when they're doing their developer portal implementation and they want to monitor what people are doing on their on the developer portal, they can listen in as webhooks. So that's kind of a change in paradigm to something we've never done before as webhooks as part of neither the Marketplace nor Gelato. Um, I'm sorry, nor Galileo. But it made sense in Gelato in terms of that functionality being given out to people. So it's kind of... It's in the API realm, but it's not a spec or a standard that we followed before. So obviously, you know, we keep making these choices. And in Kong itself, um, obviously you've used it, so you know, you know how simplistic the API is. Uh, that's another reason that we kept the API uh, for Kong itself uh, as simple as possible. And you know, especially for the admin uh, interface. And that's kind of you know for people who don't know. Uh, the way Kong operates, it is built on Nginx. It's, uh, you know, using OpenResty as the application framework and it's entirely written in Lua. And as a consumer or as a user of Kong, you really don't have to know anything about Nginx. You don't have to know anything about OpenResty. You may have never configured Nginx before in your life. And thankfully, you never have to anymore because as opposed to creating configuration files and writing scripts and uploading them to servers and reloading servers and doing all that, you know, fun but taxing work, uh, what Kong offers you is the opportunity to configure your entire API, uh, API management cluster with an actual API. So you actually make an HTTP call to Kong to configure Kong to allow other HTTP calls to happen, which is a little bit of a... Uh, Tricky thing uh, to say, but once you say it, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah, so there, there's this concept of the admin API, which is the administration interface to Kong that allows you to configure API routes, to configure uh, plugins. And by plugins, I mean things like authentication, logging, access control, and so on. Um, so you configure all of that through an HTTP API. And the HTTP API is so simplistic. You just, you know, you're setting objects and you're getting them back in JSON format. Um, there's no hypermedia on it. Uh, there's no kind of, uh, it's a very simple design of the API in itself. Uh, and the reason for that is because users of Kong may or not may or may not be developers or you know people who are dealing with APIs all the time. So a lot of the people who are actually using Kong end up being in you know kind of the big corporate scenarios, the DevOps teams or the IT teams, um, and those guys are going to just be using tools like Ansible or Chef or other orchestration tools to kind of configure systems and servers. So to keep things simple actually makes more sense for that kind of audience. As opposed, for example, if you're talking to application and mobile application developers, they might find more benefit and value in doing things like, uh, you know, how format or uh, hypermedia APIs or anything like that and kind of the specs of the API itself. So they can abstract a lot of that away into, you know, SDKs and programming languages. Well, on a little bit of a sidetrack, sorry, but for our audience, because yeah. um, I say very centric, API centric at your company and things. And I'm just wondering, the, you brought in the word microservices there. And I'm just yeah. wondering, <laughs> I'm just wondering kind of how you feel, you know, what is your definition of a microservice and how you feel, how you do it at Mashape? So th- th- this is a, a, a war topic. That's I know, I, I, I heard it on the, uh, on the change log and it was, uh, what yeah. you put up was very interesting. So I thought maybe I'll bring it up again. So, I mean, look, from historical context, we've been, we've been down this path before, right? So but the problem is people don't remember history or at least don't research it as much. Um, there's a thing called the Oasis Group and people should really look that up. And what the Oasis Group is, is a set of companies, primarily people like IBM and Microsoft and bigger businesses back, I think, in the 90s. They came together and wanted to create standards and specs around how uh, you know communication is done between applications over the internet. Um, obviously on top of HTTP because the entire web runs on HTTP, but they didn't like... Uh, the kind of loosey-goosey scenario that HTTP was in. So they ended up creating the set of standards called web services. Uh, and then web service, uh, so the, the moniker ended up being WS-authentication, uh, WS-rate uh, limiting, WS-whatever, right? So all these specs that apply to different scenarios and things. And they're all written in XML because XML was kind of the dominant choice at the time. And uh, they, they used a format called SOAP which is just a very, very heavy XML descriptive language of verbiage and actions and data. 
And at the end of the day, you know, they have a very complete set of standards, which to this day I still go back and look at because there is some valuable knowledge to be gained from that. Um, but what ended up happening because of the overcomplication of the specs and the standards, um, at first they were inter interesting because there was this promise of standardization that everybody wants. Everyone but... loves that idea, don't they? I think Exactly. But then at the end of the day, just you have so many standards. You're, you're, you're spending more time building your application to the standard than building your application logic and your business value. Uh, and then people just abandoned all of that and just fell apart. Uh, unfortunately, some, some businesses are still operating on the SOAP standard because they've invested so much in it um, and all the w, WS standards to the point where now people call them the WF Death Star because it was just <laughs> the w, WS Star as kind of the WS uh, wildcard. But now it's just WF Death Star because it just became the death of a lot of programmers. And, and, and back to today's world, we're trying to go back the same route again. So we talk about microservices as this new evolutionary thing that people can just change the way they're doing stuff. It's not really that different. Um, we've had uh, software-oriented architecture, too, as a kind of phase in between SOAP and uh, REST and yep. now microservices. And they all revolve around the same concept. And as long as people kind of... Um, get to appreciate the differences or the nuances between these different concepts, then it doesn't matter what standard you follow, whether it's microservices or so, or, or even SOAP. If you want to use XML, that's quite fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so to me, there, it comes down to three things. There is modularization, uh, there is compotentization, and there is um, uh, microservices or services or however you want to label it. Uh, and the problem is people all, all confuse services or microservices uh, with components and modules a lot. So in our own code, on the code level, you can obviously write modules. So modules are self-contained entities that are, you know, easily tested, easily deployed, easily versioned, and so on. Um, same thing with components. Components can be a group of modules that are also self-contained, that are also test, you know, testable and self-distributable and so on. And same, and same thing on the service level, it's the same description. So you, you can see the pattern there and the kind of description that carries through. But the difference is when you're talking about the module level, you're talking about a programming language specific module that might or might not have uh, an opinionated way of doing things. So for example, in JavaScript uh, today, we have this concept of modules and it's just you export some functions and uh, you pass in some options and that's it. It's a library. That's all it's supposed to do. And you can write tests around that and verify that that works. Uh, but then that by itself doesn't do anything. You have to put it together. So let's say a module is a username lookup or a username login. Uh, and, and then if you put it together with, you know, the rest of the components that make the system. So you talk about, uh, you know, a login page. A login page would require a username lookup com uh, module, a uh, an email address verification mod yeah. module, and, and so on. So you put those together and now you have a login system. Great. Now I have a login system. You, you put a test around it. You perhaps you want to version it indiv individually. You can set it all up. That's still all program pro programmable. There's no, uh, anything touching on network. There's nothing touching on HTTP or communication there per se. Um, it's possible, but not, that's not really the main purpose of it. Uh, so they're great. Now you have a login system. That's still not a product. That's still not a service to get to the point of having an individual service that is operating on its own that actually serves some value. That's where you need to put something on a server and run it through the web and actually being able to get access to it through HTTP. And that's where people are trying to define microservices as today, as these kind of self-contained entities that happen to choose HTTP as the communication method between them. Uh, but they, are, they actually serve a purpose. They serve, uh, a, like they can be a standalone product. They're a justifiable a unit, aren't they? They're, yeah, yeah. They're just, yeah. So that, that part I, I, I fully, you know, support or understand, but in a lot of cases, when you talk to people today about microservices, they end up confusing microservices with components, or they end up confusing microservices with modules. And then they, you know, you have these companies that are talking about how we have, you know, 50,000 microservices or 20,000 microservices. I'm like, no, no, you don't. You have 50,000 components, or maybe perhaps 50,000 modules, but you probably have 20 microservices. Um, and again, it's a clash of definition. Do you find that with the work that you do, because uh, like with the community and things like that, where people then were starting to look into API, uh, like into Kong, and like kind of idea of maybe even trying to split out their architecture into this, in quote, microservices, that they get confused there as well? They do. And, and that's part of the, I mean, the reason we made it unopinionated in that way, because people are free to choose what path they want to take. Yeah. But that also became a challenge too, because like you said, people can get confused and they're probably used to kind of the scenario of these uh 
tools and products that are being sold to them being so opinionated to the point of like to help them guide through yeah opinion. yeah forget about your pers- personal opinion this is how you should do it this is the silver whereas bullet with, this is the way we're going to do it exactly whereas with kong it's a, it's the opposite it's like no tell me what you want to do and we'll make it work um and that's where people get confused because you know in kong you can actually define an api route uh obviously because it's a proxy you have to define the entry point and the upstream point so the way to do that in kong you either define a host name basically using the dns address system so you can say anything that comes in with a request for this particular host name uh this is where you send it to the upstream this is where the actual api lives so that's you know the most basic scenario that's very similar to like how nginx work uh and then the other way to do it is through uh endpoints or paths so URI paths, you can define and say, okay, anything that comes in on slash v1 slash uh, consumers goes to this upstream. Anything that comes on slash v1 slash uh, finances or any other kind of receipts or any system that you're building goes to this other endpoint. Um, so people can think of the upstream endpoints as microservices, as an example, right? So every endpoint or every upstream that is independently operated can be its own microservice, basically serving a, a purpose or uh, a full kind of scope of a pro- uh, of the product on its own, um, but that's not always that's not always the case. You might actually have uh, the same API, the same system, but you have different endpoints that you actually want to have different rate limitings on. So you can still do that with Kong, but that doesn't mean each endpoint in Kong is now a microservice. It's just it's just an endpoint. Uh, you're just defining different l- rules and logic around it. So in the case of upstream servers, you can have, you know, a completely different architecture serving each individual API route behind Kong, or it could all be the same one system, one monolithic system, but you're just kind of abstracting the logic away with Kong and providing yourself with the ability to be more flexible and dynamic. Because a lot of the the scenarios we're seeing with people using Kong, they're either coming from the old SOAP world, or they have old systems that they want to update. And what they end up doing, they end up setting the paths in Kong that end up being virgined or end up being kind of the, the separation that they needed to have uh, as they transition their systems to, you know, restful stuff and more kind of modern way of doing APIs. Uh, and within Kong, um, you know, you have, so you've got this single entry now, uh, this proxy in. And, and with that, then you've also got the ability to kind of have this idea of sharing similar requirements because all these microservices, these service APIs you have, they, you know, authentication, logging, request limiting, you know, re- uh, re- right request, response, transformations. These can all now be dealt with within, you know, this single em- this single proxy idea. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and, and kind of your thought pattern and w- why you decide to do it the way you did it and you know dealing with the plugin architecture and things like that so the again going back to the marketplace needs and requirements um some people had their api and let's talk about authentication is kind of the basic example some people had oauth 2 on their api some people had basic authentication on their api and some people had you know uh, key authentication just a standard kind of thing in the header that they used and a few other methods um you couldn't build a proxy system that just proxies things through and expect to have a diverse way of doing authentication because it's just entirely different. So this is where the plugin-oriented architecture came in. And the plugin-oriented or- oriented architecture allows you to have all the different routes that, I'm des- that I described earlier, whether through headers or paths, and um, set up different rules on them. So the request lifecycle is very simple. Request hits the uh, Kong server. Uh, Kong looks up any information uh, related to that request in terms of routing at first to know exactly where to send it and then looks into the series of plugins that are configured for this API or this API route, and then executes the logic with these, within these plugins. So as an example, you can have an API route, let's say, you know, slash uh, users, and you want to put in a authentication on that. So you put in, let's just say, OAuth2 authentication. So uh, when the request comes into Kong, uh, Kong looks at the request. If it says slash users in it, then great, it's going to go through this particular path. This particular path has OAuth2 authentication on it, so I'm going to challenge the requester with a 403 header or 401 header, depending on what they're sending in their headers, and make sure that authentication actually happens and the handshake happens in Kong. If the authentication is successful, I let that request go through and then continues going down the line of whatever else is configured on this path. So say down the path, there's also some rate limiting configured. So now that I've authenticated this caller of this API, uh, I can actually now look up at the rest of the information associated with this caller or this API. So you can have rate limiting, for example. You can have rate limiting on the API itself, and then you can have a special rate limiting rule on this caller or this consumer. So, um, 
for example, uh, we have this concept of a consumer in the system that is an abstract concept of anything or anybody that's calling your API. You can, you know, make a consumer as a user, as far as, as far as your kind of architectural design is concerned. You can make a consumer as an application or as another system that's calling their API, it doesn't matter. But the power of the consumer is that you can set special rules and special plugins that apply only to that consumer because of authentication. So as a general API, you can put rate limiting, you can put logging, you can put transformations and a lot of other features onto the API through the plugins uh, that all execute during the request lifecycle. Um, but so the moment you authenticate a consumer, you can actually still do all of these things, but also make special use cases for special consumers. So if you have a consumer that's perhaps too problematic and calling your APIs too much, um, even though you have rate limiting, you just, this guy is just making, he's like always calling 99.9% .9 of the rate limit every time. You can, you know, rate limit them even further without affecting the rest of the consumers. So it's a uh, very flexible model for sure. Exactly. And if you even if you think about debugging and, and being able to find issues, even if in production, usually you have logs in place and you can look at these logs and then you have to find and search about information within the logs. But in a scenario where you're using Kong, you can easily just enable logging on production in real time. You don't have to reload servers or restart servers or do anything. You can just enable logging for a particular consumer and then send that logging information to a new destination and just start watching only this consumer's logs. Um, without having to reload systems or redeploy systems or do anything. This, is, can, this can actually happen in production uh, without any risk to the system. So this is actually all of a sudden a powerful way to also kind of not only set up rules on a system, but also debug the system and get more insight about who's using it and how they're using it and what's going on uh, in, in production as well. With the plugin architecture, you know, it really is so flexible with the ability, you know, because I, I know the documentation had been recently updated, uh, how it hooks into the request lifecycle. And I'm just wondering, out of shape then, do you use uh, just the plugin architecture for all of your proprietary, you know, secret source, as well as the stuff that you release open source? Yeah, we use the same thing internally, of course. Um, obviously, like I said earlier, like we have some, you know, plugins that are configured specifically to the use cases of our products. So obviously those things like billing on the marketplace, it's a very specific use case. Um, so that's proprietary and that's also a plugin that we wrote internally. And, and and that's the other thing, like because not only because the project is open source, but the way the plugins work, you can actually install and distribute, create your and distribute your own plugin uh, using Lua Rocks as well. So, and we actually have a number of third party uh, partners and people who are not only building plugins for their own usage internally, but also going to be publishing plugins uh, soon. So actually, I know of at least three companies are going to be publishing their plugins for Kong very soon. And they're going to be like other businesses around the API space, whether it's logging or analytics or, um, you know, testing tools that are out there. So, you know, keep an eye out for that announcement. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be awesome. And, and obviously that brings up Lua. And uh, so with the choice of uh, Nginx, what other, obviously Lua then is the, is a language, a scripting language fits very well in. And I'm just wondering, like, was there any other decision, like any other, like, you, did you ever think about going, maybe going the go route route or like maybe make your own version? like own web proxy in C? What, 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 what made you really like Nginx? So like I said earlier, the, the performance that we saw on Nginx was unparalleled. And, um, you know, really as an HTTP server, it covers not only all the use cases that you would expect from an HTTP server, but also provides, um, you know, this ability to do things on the TCP level, do things with WebSockets that is coming to an Nginx. Um, and as an architecture, it's a pretty solid system that was built Um uh, and actually, like, I think there was a stat and metric that I saw the other day where it's like 70% uh, of the internet uses Nginx or something like that. <laughs> well, so, that's a pretty good know, stat, yeah. It's, it's you know, it's, the success of Nginx is evident in the usage of it. Like, there's really no debate around that. Now, in terms of why we picked that as the basis for um, our proxy system or API management system is, is very simple. Um, we wanted to focus on solving problems for the API providers and the API developers. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel on building uh, HTTP servers. Uh, at the end of the day, if the technology itself is very simple, um, whether it's a proxy or an API management gateway or anything else, you're just doing HTTP calls. Um, that problem has been solved, been solved by many people, and has been solved, you know, in an excellent fashion by Nginx in terms of having this proxy system that is very capable of handling everything on the HTTP side. Um, so why reinvent the wheel? Why should we Absolutely. ever have to build something all over again? We don't believe in, in that. And we, we want to encourage people to use more of Nginx, obviously. Um, so we built we build the Kong system on top of it. In terms of Lua as the choice, 
in many ways, that choice was already made for us. Um, having OpenRSD and the Lua bindings into Nginx was, has been around for years and years and years. And in fact, uh, everybody in the industry who is on the uh, kind of ISP level or CDN level, if you talk to Fastly or Cloudflare or even Amazon themselves, and a lot of people in the ISP business, they all use Nginx and they all use Lua as kind of the definitive way of configuring and setting up systems, um, like networking systems over HTTP. So for us, when you know, when we and of course we're already doing that for ourselves as well in the marketplace with Nginx and Lua. So you know, only recently did Nginx come up with the uh, JavaScript announcement, and it's not really JavaScript. It's not really a full spec of ECMAScript yet, but uh, it's getting there. And we did some benchmarks as well as a few others people did. On, I don't know if you saw it on Reddit and or on Hacker News. People did the benchmarks on JavaScript uh, within Nginx versus Lua within Nginx, and I think it was like. 10,000 times slower or something wow. like that. Yeah, it's just, it's just not there uh, in terms of performance. And as, as API providers, one of the that main matters. components of yeah. your, you know, product is performance. So, you know, obviously things like Go and other languages can actually have the same performance level, but you have to start from crash, scratch. And then you have to reinvent the wheel on building HTTP servers and proxy servers. And essentially, if we want to build something in Go, for example, then we're reinventing Nginx. Um, from the ground up, which has already been tried and tested and tested, say so he's got seventy percent market, you know, internet, you know, usage. Precisely. So you know, it really is like a no-brainer. Um, and with Lua, then, so Lua as a language, a scripting language, what what is it? Is it very similar to any other languages that are out? It's a very simple scripting language. I mean, for me, I find a lot of similarities between it and JavaScript, which you know just goes to say of how simple it is and how easy it is to get to get uh, to get. Because it's, it's a prototypical language, isn't it? So it is very yeah. similar to yeah. It's very similar. It's very simple. And, you know, Lua has been around for years and years and years, and people have been using it, obviously, in ga- the gaming industry a lot. So, you know, the two type of people you typically encounter, and I don't want to stereotype this, but generally speaking, it's either going to be gamers or sysadmins who know all about Lua. Uh, obviously, gamers, because of the lightweight scripting systems that are, exist in a lot of the gaming engines, uses Lua. Um, and in the case of sysadmins or DevOps or IT people, it's because of Nginx. So again, that goes back to the validation of the of the language choice there, because um, it makes sense for a scripting language to be simple and very efficient and very fast to run on something as important in terms of performance, and it needs to be as fast as possible, like an API pro- uh, gateway Absolutely. or API server. Yeah, because I think Lua's got very good C bindings, which makes it easy to integrate. Yep. And I think that yeah, so I think that's been a really good win for it. And and what's the like the ecosystem around it like? Because I know you mentioned Lua Rocks, and if you go on their website, you notice that the Meshape or oh, the Kong actually sorry logo at the bottom supporting it. So if you do you kind of give back a lot then to the Lua community. Yeah, absolutely. We love the Lua community, and like you said, we support uh, Lua Rocks in terms of sponsoring the project because it it in itself is an open source project too. And uh, you know we've. We just, by nature of doing a lot of things in Lua, we end up making a lot of friends in the Lua community, especially people who work on open RESTy projects. Uh, and, uh, you know, we also found ourselves kind of diving in and either taking ownership and maintenance of a lot of the projects in Lua or enhancing on them uh, just by, you know, virtue of needing them. So that's interesting because the, you know, the Lua community has been around for a longer time than we have. Uh, but uh, I think for the most part, they they have the tools that worked for them and for the particular use cases, and they really didn't expand on them too much. So, for example, there was a Lua Cassandra driver that's been around for a long time, but you know it it didn't really follow the entirety of the spec, nor did it do uh, kind of like all the requirements of load balancing within Cassandra, for example. Um, it just did like a very simple round ro- round robin kind of random selection of servers. So. Because we wanted to improve the performance of Kong and make sure the Kong and Cassandra connection are always kind of uh, guaranteed to be successful. Um, so if one node in Cassandra goes down, Kong doesn't go down. We basically took over the driver and ended up, you know, implementing the entire spec of the driver to make sure the functionality is up to speed with what the Cassandra systems expect. Um, and we've been doing that a lot with a lot of the Lua modules and the Lua, um, uh, modules that are published on Lua Rocks recently. So you're, you're probably seeing our fingerprint in many of the Lua <laughs> ecosystem now. And it's a small ecosystem in comparison to some of the others, like in comparison to, let's say, JavaScript or PHP. It's a yeah, smaller ecosystem. Yeah, NPM and things like that. Yeah. I mean, APM is massive. But, yeah. yeah. Um, There's so many choice for the exact same thing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we were actually joking around the other day. Uh, we made a, um, 
and no op module and npm and then like <laughs> three times and we just ended up like forking it from each other making small changes and then publishing it back on npm just for fun um but yeah npm is a bit too massive oh dear yeah and and, and so because one thing with lua then you've got these open resty as you have you've you mentioned and i'm just wondering yep. what is then open resty so you can think of open resty as you know for those who are not familiar with it you can think of it as the application framework on top of nginx essentially um it's just the web app server that um uh, operates on top of nginx using the lua bindings obviously uh to allow you to script and create custom configuration on top of nginx that otherwise you can't do so with nginx by itself you only do uh, configuration files based on the spec and the standard that's already published within nginx but with open resty um it extends all of that into functional components that you can actually tap into and use the functions and the classes and the methods within it to actually um, configure Nginx even more. But essentially, all, all it's doing is just exposing the Nginx internals, uh, the C binding level, into a scriptable layer using Lua. And then, as you say, so you've got Kong, and then you've obviously need a data store. And uh, the data store of choice here is Cassandra. And I'm just wondering maybe where you can go through like the thought process of why you went with Cassandra. I know that there's a lot of work now going into like making Postgres support, uh, like a very active, like loud community at the moment without the fact of wanting Postgres support. I'm just wondering like, yeah. So what, where you kind of came from with using that as the data store? So yeah, again, with many of the decisions and many of the uh, um, kind of architectural designs that we came up with Kong, it came from the marketplace. Like I said, because the marketplace had the need of being, you know, distributed globally. Um, Cassandra obviously offers that out of the box. Um, so, and we evaluated a lot of databases in terms of both performance as well as uh, ease of use in terms of how do we have a system that's distributed, um, uh, that's a, that, 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 with a data store that's distributed as well. So Cassandra was the obvious choice for that and it actually solved that problem quite nicely and easily. So you can actually have a Cassandra cluster within a network and then have a different Cassandra cluster between uh, and a different network on a different region and then cluster both these clusters together. So you can have a cluster of clusters uh, and it's all quite easy to set up and really seamless. Um, and as far as uh, Kong is concerned, it just connects to its local kind of representation of Cassandra or its local cluster and just deals with that. And then everything else is synced. So the result of that is when you, let's say, create a new route in Kong using the API, you just simply make an API call to any which one of the nodes in Kong. Say you have 50 nodes of Kong, it doesn't matter. You make one API call to one of them, it configures itself, updates the information in Cassandra, and then Cassandra automatically propagates that data across all the other nodes. Uh, so, you know, again, you're getting away from that scenario of having to change configurations and update servers and reload servers at massive scale. Um, so from day one, we have knew we know that Cassandra, you know, is, is an obvious choice for, you know, global distribution and, you know, bigger networking components. But we know as well that a lot of people don't necessarily have that need and they might just want to run the server locally with their own Postgres database or something simple that just serves their own usage, perhaps internally as well. They don't need local uh, network distribution. Uh, so from the start, we did, we did introduce a, a database abstraction layer uh, with SQL because we knew down the road that we wanted to add uh, different uh, kind of uh, database engines. And what we're going to be doing next is Postgres SQL as the next choice of database to be supported for, with Kong. That's awesome. And, and is there anything else on the roadmap for Kong? Like a bigger, bigger, or is it very much like minor kind of additions? There, there's actually some major things happening right now. So as part of the release that may come out later this week or perhaps next week, um, we're adding clustering logic into Kong itself. So the Kong nodes themselves become more aware of each other, uh, which is a huge deal for, you know, avoiding having to do any caching on the system. So the way it works now, for example, um, like I said, you can configure a route through the API and then that's stored in the, you know, in the memory of the individual server. And then as it propagates to the other servers as well, it's also stored in memory. But, you know, to avoid calling the database every single time, because you don't want to do that as a proxy, uh, we keep that memory in cache for a certain period of time to make sure that it doesn't expire. And you know, as soon as as long as things don't change, it works fine. But if things do change, then you have a caching period of uh, I think five five seconds by default, and you can change that to get uh, to get the new information. So with this new release that's actually ha coming up uh, this week, we're gonna put out a release candidate. And, you know, I'd like for you to test it as well. Many other people to test it, get more feedback out of it. It's actually introducing clustering awareness into Kong nodes. So um, now, if and when anything changes in any of the nodes, they notify each other about the change. And therefore, the, de the dependency on a database is really even 
less so than yeah. before to the point where you, you may in the future you may not even need a database at all and can all be done in memory that is cool um and, and also within the sql support is there actually an eta on that or is that just kind of as and when it's ready well no you actually wanted to get the clustering logic in first and do that right before we go down the the postgres support because you know if we did that if we did the postgres support first and we're still dealing with caches and still dealing with, uh, you know, database dependency that we'd like to decouple even further. So it was a kind of a, a, a choice that we made of going yeah. down the path of getting the clustering logic in first and a few, as well as a few, you know, other enhancements that we're working on. Um, and then we're doing the Postgres support. So you're probably going to see the Postgres support uh, later in Q1. And then with just distributions of uh, Kong, like how do you, so that I know that if you go to the, you know, to on to the Kong GitHub repository, you can see the releases, you can get, you know, compiled versions already. You can also have like, you've got your Docker instances and stuff like that that you can play around with. I was wondering, Atmoshape, how do you do it? Do you have like your own pre-compiled special build at all? Or do you run it along with, because one thing I was going to ask is that it is essentially, there is no, it's not a hacked version of Nginx. It is just a vanilla Nginx just with Kong, Lua, you know, on top of it yeah it's just uh uh, nginx through openrest and our application uh, kind of logic on top of that there's no patching or customization of it i think there there was a patch to the https uh, module in openrest that we kind of uh, included in uh, but i think it's been merged into openrest since um so in a lot of ways we're sometimes ahead of openrest before those mergers are changed in uh, because we're helping them patch some stuff um but uh, generally speaking, no, you're correct. There's nothing special or unique about it. It's just open REST with our own application logic on it. Would you at all kind of recommend to, to have a separate, say if you have an Nginx installation already, would it be possible to be able to use Kong within that installation or would it be better to have a separate Kong distribution along with its own Nginx and then your application as well? Well, that's the nice thing about Kong is that, you know, because it's running on Nginx and for anybody who's familiar with the Nginx and internal workings, you basically have uh, definitions of servers within the Nginx configuration that listens on different ports and different uh, uh, host names. So in the case of Kong, it's listening in on two ports, the proxying port, of course, and that's where all the API calls go, and the admin port for the configuration. So if you have your already existing Nginx setup that listens on certain ports and do certain things like, say, surf static files perhaps, or maybe has its own reverse lo- lo- uh, proxying logic with some customization that you've created for yourself, you can still use the same instance that's within Kong. So actually, part of Kong, there is a configuration file. You don't really have to edit it uh, at all when you set up and use Kong. But if you do, like you said, you do have the scenario where you already have Nginx, you're already using um, you know, some proxying logic within Nginx, or maybe you know the simplest use case, you're serving some static files from within it, you can add that same definition of the server into the Kong configuration. And if you look at the Kong configuration, you'll actually see the entirety of the Nginx configuration that you would actually see in your own setup. There's nothing different about it uh, other than the Lua bindings and the Lua connection into it. So if you have your own Nginx setup, you don't have to have two of them running at the same time, like Nginx and Kong individually. Uh, Because Kong is just running Nginx, you can have the same setup that you have running in the same instance of Kong perhaps listening on different ports or different addresses uh, and get the same results that you're getting before with the addition of having now Kong operating on your infrastructure. That's awesome. And is there any kind of, is it uh, is there a rule or kind of a thought that you would not tamper with Nginx then? You you want to keep on the Lua kind of binding, stay in that, sp- that space as opposed to maybe forking Nginx at any time and doing your own thing? Um. You mean for for us and kind of the yeah Kong, okay, okay, yeah like my shape like kind of would would you would you think about maybe forking Nginx and doing your own thing like within C and things like that kind of looking into that t- space or do you, are you happy with the Lua kind of level? No, we're 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 quite we're quite happy with the with Nginx itself and we're big advocates of it, of course. Um, what usually happens is sometimes we need things that are beyond the scope of Lua and beyond the scope of Nginx. So we end up including the C libraries directly. And that's actually is one of the powers of Lua is that, like you said, it has the binding relationship. It's really good. So for example, we included the, like, uh, the UID library from C directly in Kong for generating UIDs because the Lua one or the Lua based one wasn't really as strong. You know, that's, that's, an easy example for anybody who has their own kind of C level bindings or C level bi- libraries or even C for that matter. Um, you can just use that directly and you can actually extend the whole ecosystem of Kong and Nginx and uh, OpenResty beyond 
anything that uh, they were designed to even do from the start. So it's very powerful in that regard. And you mentioned distributions and builds before. Like we also have, like we just build uh, Kong directly and there's the whole compiling uh, configuration and instructions uh, on the website too. And we just build those and pre, uh, pre-compile pre them into different package systems. So like for um, the different Debian versions, the different uh, Red Hat versions and CentOS, uh, as well as Docker. But it seems that, you know, Docker is just the tool of choice that everybody's using today. Definitely winning out there. It's just, it's just so much easier than anything else. And, you know, the nice thing about Docker is um, you don't have to, you know, in the, in, in the kind of the Debian way of reinstalling and re, uh, re-updating your code base, you can just link it to a local working directory where your actual code is running and just compile it on every save or something similar like that. So you can actually do real-time debugging and real-time development with Docker, not just as a distribution tool, but also... So is that typically tool. how you do it as well? That is that how you use it? You use the Docker install, like installate instance and then use that for developing or do, would you kind of use it on the raw metal that's that's how i do it because i i run on linux everything um but some of the other developers still use macbooks so they run uh, vagrant instead um because just you know uh, docker is not as simple to use on, on macbooks <laughs> there's like a little bit of tweaking yeah. and getting things done where vagrant just yeah. works out of the box the boot but to yeah, docker like, and all that yeah i, I don't even know how to do that because i i just have linux going and it's <laughs> quite wonderful well, what, dis- what distro of choice are you on on linux um i've always been a debian fan uh, so right now i'm learning uh, linux mint as a desktop environment and that's been quite nice and it's very stable for me so probably going to continue using that for the short the long term I, I was on ubuntu for a while and uh, you know here's another story for you when i first came to canada and uh, uh obviously because i had my laptop with me and like all the technology with me but um I realized because in Syria, everything was pirated. Everything was dirt cheap. You can just buy copies of everything, um, including all the Microsoft products. But now that I'm here, I can't just do that anymore. So it's not as simple. And uh, that's where I kind of realized that there's this open source free operating system thing called Ubuntu. And they will even ship you a CD, which is mind boggling for free. So I went online and, and I'm like, okay, here's the address. Ship me this free operating system. Let's see what it's about. And that moment when I held that CD in my hand, I'm like, wow, this company actually shipped me a CD of their entire operating system entirely free. I didn't even have to pay for shipping. I need to give this thing a try. And ever since I installed it, obviously it was hard and very terrible to set up uh, because it was a Windows machine and Ubuntu back in the day. It was, you know, installation was problematic and drivers and all these issues. Um, but as soon as I got it set up and working, that was, that was it. I never went You were stuck, yeah. It. That's uh, brilliant. Linux all the way. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Again, thank you so much, Amir, for coming on the show. It's been really interesting talking to you about all the Kong stuff and you're just talking in general about all this stuff. So is there anything you'd like to kind of mention at the end of the show? Anything you'd like to plug and things like that? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's going to be some announcements and releases coming up uh, in the next couple of days in terms of Kong itself. Um, but the one thing I really want to, want to see uh, from the community is uh, we do have a, you know, obviously we do have the GitHub project and we talk a lot to the issues to the community, but we also have a Gitter channel. And there's nothing I love more than just talking to people and hearing their use cases and their stories about the problems they're solving and uh, how they're using Kong. Or even if they're not using Kong, I just want to, you know, hear your stories about API development and the problems you're solving in that space and see what we can learn from each other. You know, obviously we have a lot to share from our history of building API tools and products, but also I want to hear back from people and developers out there. Uh, what are the problems they're facing? What issues they're dealing with every day and what challenges that they're doing? Perhaps there might be something we can help solve there or if for nothing else, it might be a good story to share. Absolutely. Uh, but before I actually forget, so also you say that about the community and things and like how vi- how vibrant have you found the community to be and helpful? I noticed there's a lot of like GUI few applications and things like that available uh, obviously my, my company i work for we've been used doing like things like config and things yep. like that i'm just wondering like how how has it been like uh, with the community open sourcing it like the popularity of it kind of increasing it's been amazing and you know this is not my first foray into open source communities and projects so like i've I'm actually quite surprised and happily surprised that the the con community has came together so fast because usually an open source project takes a while to kind of grow and for the right community to come together and for people to start contributing and start being part of the real community and the real ecosystem. 
But uh, with Kong, it was actually so fast. It was, you know, scary fast. Like within the first uh, few weeks of us launching it, we started seeing those star numbers on GitHub <laughs> rise. And I think we're at like almost 4,000 stars now or something like that. Um, they keep rising. And, you know, as uh, just as much as the star count rises, we also saw community members joining our channel on Gitter and talking to us and actually engaging with us. And then there's, you see those kind of back and forth interactions on GitHub too, which is amazing. Like, that's the real value, a, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, we have our own ideas and we have our own kind of approach to solving problems, but, you know, I don't want to be enforcing my opinion on everybody else. And I want to hear what people have to say. And a lot of these people are very passionate about their opinions too, which is great because then you can actually have a real debate about that's it. And it follows what Kong that. is, isn't it? It's trying not to be, you know, kind of set in stone what it is, what, you know, how to do things. It's catering for all. Precisely. And, and that's where, you know, everybody can appreciate that and they can start, you know, both, uh, contributing to it, but also sharing their feedback to the rest of the community. So we see a lot of times, you know, we're in the Gitter channel and we're just sitting back and watching because people come in and ask questions and then other people from the community answer their questions. We don't really have to be as involved, uh, <laughs> That's which is awesome. kind of cool. That yeah. is very cool. Well, thank you again, to, Ahmed. Thank you so much for the time taken, you know, to come on the podcast. And yeah, it's really great. So audience, it's been another great episode and speak to you next week. Goodbye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at 3devsandamaybe.com or follow us on Twitter at the number 3, Devs and a Maybe. <laughs>